Okay, hi everybody. Ah, good to see you, thank you for coming. This is the next in our series of insights into A Course in Miracles, based on my book, A Course in Miracles Made Easy. And today's subject matter is about the happy dream. So let's all start with a prayer as we usually do. So if you would take a breath with me. And we recognize that every single person here is connected to source that you are a divine being that has come into form to explore form in order to return to spirit. And so we open the door now for insight, for awakening, for connection, for healing. And we ask that each person who is joining us, whether you're joining live or on recording, receive a blessing. Something happens in your heart that allows you to feel better, more relieved, less fearful, more loving. And in line with our theme today, we ask the blessing that you create a happy dream, that whatever's in your life, you go deeper and allow yourself to see through the eyes of love. And as a result, the world that you look upon changes in wonderful and beautiful and miraculous ways. And so it is. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, our theme for today is our happy dream. Let's look at the person who is happy. <laughs> and so, Question Miracles tells us, as we looked at last month, that life is but a dream. Do you remember that old song, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream? Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Hmm, where'd that come from? Uh, the Hindus and Buddhists call it maya. It means it's an illusion. When you're sleeping, you go to all kinds of different worlds. You have all kinds of different experiences. And the Question Miracles tells us that The physical world is really not much different than the spiritual world or the, put it as the dream world, because it's just a little more dense and slower. When you're sleeping at night, you're in the realm of mind and spirit and emotion only. The physical plane is kind of put aside. And so you have these very rapid movements from different worlds one to another. You can be walking in your garden and the next day you're in the city. The next moment you're in the city, you could be making love with somebody and the next minute you're fighting with them. You could be become a bird and fly over the mountains. And then you could become a fish and you're swimming in the sea. And so the Course says that this physical world is just another dream, slower and denser. So one day you get a big check and you're happy. The next day you get a big bill and you're unhappy. One day you meet somebody, you fall in love. Next day you're out of love. One day you get a great job. The next day COVID comes along and your job is gone. The next day it's back. Uh, one day your body's not working. Next day it's working. Next day it's not. The next day it is. And the Course says that wherever you go with your mind is where your experience goes. And so the Course wants to train us. The Course is essentially a mind training. It's getting us to think differently. And it tells us that mind is the source of all of our experiences behind every emotion is a thought. You have to have a certain belief in order to have an emotion come up. So let's say you believe that somebody who looks in a certain way is attractive, and then you see somebody who looks like that, and you fall in love with them, that person. So which came first, the feeling or the thought? Well, the thought came first, because you had a belief system that somebody who looks like that is attractive. If you didn't think that thought, you wouldn't have had that emotion. So what the Course wants us to do is 
keep tweaking our thoughts and reassessing and reinventing our thoughts so we start to think with God instead of away from God. Think with love instead of with fear. And so it's a mind training course. Okay, let's move on. So we're going to talk about uh, illusions and reality. And it says, it says in the course that a deep sleep, the, the course actually quotes Genesis. And in the book of Genesis and the five books of Moses, it says, a deep sleep fell upon Adam. And then the course tells us, but nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that Adam woke up. Isn't that interesting? So the point is that we're all still Adam sleeping. That Adam going to sleep equals a spiritual being falling into the illusion or delusion that the separate world, that the physical world is the only world, and that we're separate from each other. And the whole purpose of the Course is to wake us up from the deep sleep that Adam fell into, which is a metaphor for our going to our going asleep to our physical nature, to our spiritual nature, by believing that our physical nature is our only nature. You are not a soul that has, you are not a body that has a soul, you are a soul that has a body. And so the Course is constantly referring to illusions, it's saying that you have been steeped in illusion and now you're coming home to truth. And wherever there is pain, there must be illusion because truth, the Course says, is never frightening. Don't you love that, sp that statement? Truth is never frightening. If you're frightened in any way, then you have moved away from truth. And the only way to get out of fear is to move back to truth. Let me say that again. If you're scared at all, you have been subject to some kind of illusion, some kind of lie about yourself, about the world, about somebody else. So this is this is from the course, and it says. The Holy Spirit, ever practical in his wisdom, accepts your dreams and uses them as a means for waking. Now let's just preface this by saying that the Course talks about two kinds of dreams. One is the nightmare and the other is the happy dream. It assumes that as long as we're steeped in physicality and separation, then we're in some kind of nightmare. And it wants us to shift the nightmare to the happy dream. And the Course says, you would, you would have used them to remain asleep. It says, the first change before dreams disappear is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. So this is the premise for the whole idea of the happy dream. And it's saying that it's very difficult or impossible or very rare to just wake up for the, from the dream of duality and separation like that. Once in a while, a great soul comes along who does it, like Ramana Maharshi or a Jesus or a Buddha. And you know, certain people just have a quick awakening. But for most of us, what's going to happen is we're going to stay in the dream for a while and gradually awaken. And this is why the Course says that your dreams of fear must change to a happy dream. So if you believe, you're, if, you're, if you're putting yourself down for still dreaming, then that's part of the nightmare. The Course wants to just gently accept the fact that we're dreaming and then use the dream. This is what this whole lecture today is about. Use the dream as a fulcrum to shift from a nightmare to a happy dream. Okay, let's move on. 
this is another quote from the Course. These, are, these two quotes are perfectly related. And it says, fear not that you will be abruptly lifted up and hurled into reality. It says, it's kind of a funny statement, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like we're scared. Please, God, don't make it real. Not too quickly. Um, uh, time is kind. And if you use it on behalf of reality, it will keep gentle pace with you in your transition. Now, don't you love that statement? Time is kind. I love that because so many of us think that, think that time is our enemy. We don't have enough time. Time is working against us. Tick, 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 tick. We're dying, dying, dying. And we think we, you know, we're going to die and run out of time. Well, of course, would like us to run out of time. They want us to escape from time. But this, this is telling us that time is actually our friend. And if we learn how to use it properly, then we, we can fill it with new ideas that point us toward awakening instead of sleeping. And it says it'll keep gentle pace with you in your transition. It'll, it'll, uh, time, time will work on your behalf by moving you gradually instead of abruptly. Wouldn't you like to have a gradual awakening? And it says here the urgency is only in dislodging your mind from its fixed position here. And this will not leave you homeless and without a frame of reference. So, you know, it says the course is always practical. And some people make the course impractical. We can move on. So the course, the, some people make the course impractical by putting so much pressure on themselves and trying so hard and beating themselves up so much for not being enlightened or perfect or gentle or the most wonderful person you ever met. So the course is so practical. Say, okay, if you want to dream, stick in your dream. That's fine. But let's just move along. Let's just move along step by step by step. Now, you know, I teach a life coach training course. And um, in, our, in, our, in our course, we tell that, that clients always like baby steps. That there is something easier about taking a gentle step rather than being pushed over the edge. And the course is gentle. Uh, the, the, the teacher's manual tells us there are 12 attributes of a teacher of God. It's in the, under, under the teacher's manual. And it says um, one of them is trust and one of them is gentleness. So what the course wants us to do is be aware of the illusion that we're in an illusion but it also wants us to have compassion for each other while we're in the illusion. Now, um, I think I might have told the story before, but it's appropriate now, that once I was uh, teaching in Japan, just after the tsunami in 2011, and uh, you know, the 20,000 lives were lost there and tremendous property, it was a huge disaster for, for Japan. And uh, a student came to me and said, well, you know, another Course in Miracles teacher came through here before you. And we asked him, what, how should we relate to the tsunami and the, and the earthquake? And he said, oh, it didn't really happen. Nobody really died. And my student said to me, that didn't quite give me comfort. I had family members who died in that event. And this person just said, oh, it didn't happen. They didn't die. Don't worry about it. And... What I got out of that was that what, what the teacher was saying was true. I mean, the Course tells us that anything you think bad that happened didn't really happen and nobody really dies. That's the big picture of the Course. However, when somebody is in pain and they've lost a loved one or they're ill, it does not really help them to come along and hit them over the head with a metaphysical hammer. You want to say, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. And then maybe over time, if you're going to teach them, you can work with them to recognize that in the big picture, there is no death. So the Course wants us to be compassionate as well as illuminated. So let me give you examples of a few, a few people who, who had compassion. One was 
a man named Milton Petrie. I read about him. And he was a wealthy philanthropist who I think he made his money in the garment industry. And what Mr. Peachy did every day was he would read the newspaper to find somebody he could help. That's probably, <laughs> it's probably the best use of the news is to find out who you can pray for and who you can help. And he said one day he read a sad story about a beautiful young woman who was a model. And she had a fight with her boyfriend. And he hired someone to slash her face. She was accosted on the street and he took a knife. And her face was all ripped up with a knife. Horrible, horrible, horrible. And so Mr. Petrie had such compassion for this woman that he paid for her to have plastic uh, reconstructive surgery to restore her face as well as possible to the beauty that she had beforehand. And then I think he gave her uh, many thousands of dollars every year to keep, um, you know, fine tuning her face so she could have a nice face again. So that was an example of compassion within the illusion. He, he could say, well, you know, she's not her face. She's not a body. She's a spirit. This is part of her spiritual lesson. So I doubt everybody will learn from it. Well, he could have said that, but, but he said, no, no this, this young woman's hurting. Let me help her. Um, I also read about a group of cosmetic surgeons along the same lines who donated their time and skill to restore the physical appearances of women who had been beaten or abused in any way. And I saw a beautiful documentary on TV about this, and they showed that these women who um, had their faces all messed up, they had their faces covered after the cosmetic surgery, and then they unwrap the, you know, the gauze. And you should have seen them looking in the mirror and seeing their face restored. I mean, it was, it was deeply touching. They all came to tears. It was like a miracle that somebody helped them restore their appearance. And it was only because those very gracious and generous cosmetic surgeons donated their time. And then more recently, I heard about, um, and after COVID began, that in Australia, there was a man who was uh, walking past a line of people uh, lined up in order to receive public assistance because they lost their jobs and didn't have food. And what this man did was he went to his bank and he withdrew $10,000. And he gave each person in line a hundred dollars and he said my reward was to see their face light up so it's very tempting to kind of just go to the big picture say oh nothing bad really happened and these people will be helped by god and uh, but someone said pray with your feet moving that if you're going to pray for somebody why not back up your prayers with action and not just hope that somebody helps them, but if you and I could help them in some way, why not let's do it? Because then we are, we're actually in that moment, turning the nightmare into a happy dream. It's still a dream, but the bad dream turns to a good dream. Let's move on. So this word join, is a very powerful word in, in The Course of Miracles. It talks a lot about joining. What does that mean? It means that we, we step back from the belief that we have separate interests. The Course talks a lot about joined interests and separate interests. And it says, when we realize that we're all here for the same purpose, and we're all in this together, we have a whole different attitude and all kinds of different things happen than when it's every man or woman for him or herself. In fact, it, it credits the joining of Bill Thetford and Helen Shuckman as the seminal moment of A Course in Miracles. We've heard the story before, but very briefly, these two people, college professors, PhDs, and they were fighting and for a long time, they had a bitter relationship. They were associates, same, same university. And one day, Bill came to Helen and said, you know, Helen, 
there must be a better way. Uh, we can't really go on like this. And she said, yes, Bill, I agree. Let's look for a better way. And the Course says, those, that moment of joining, when they agreed to give up their separate interest and say, we're in this together, let's work this out, that changed their vibration. It opened Helen and Bill up, so they both lifted to a higher frequency, and then the door was open for the Course in Miracles to come to Helen Shuckman. So two people joining with this was the source of A Course in Miracles. So I want to show you a, a lovely video now. Uh, Nishank, I'll do this if you could un undo your screen. Thank you. Nishank's just doing a fabulous job helping. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm not a victim. Uh, here we go. Alan, I have caught you. Okay. You, do you have it too, Nishank? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nishank is very gracious. None of us could do by ourselves. And this is the Course in Miracles way of saying that the happy dream is the one in which we join. Those guys could not have pulled that dog out if they had had separate interests. The dog was patient too, got a hand into the dog, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that, I certainly do. Okay, let's move on please. So, the course, the course talks about pleasure. And it says that what we call pleasure is not real pleasure. We usually think of pleasure as physical pleasure, good taste, good sex, being outdoors, exercise, and that's all fine. That's all part of life on earth. We're, we're not putting that down. However, what it's saying is that there's a deeper pleasure and that's doing God's will. Now, this sounds kind of like, oh, be obedient to God, do God's will. Yeah, okay, got it. But what it's saying is that when you, God's will is for our deepest happiness. And when we align with the will of God, we're aligning with the deepest form of joy. And, you know, we've heard follow your bliss and do what excites you and you know, be at peace with yourself. And what it's saying is there's a level of bliss there's a level of soul reward that transcends what we usually call pleasure. And we really, when we really line up with spirit, then the level of pleasure that we experience is so much more profound than a simple momentary hit. And the, the metaphor I love is from the film Groundhog Day. I'm sure you've all seen that. Um, Bill Murray plays a, pretty sour guy whose life sucks and his relationships are horrible and everything about him doesn't work. And then he starts waking up and having the same day every day. And he even tries to kill himself, but he can't because he keeps waking up and having the same day. It's a metaphor, isn't it? And then, so he just, he becomes immortal, so to speak. And he just starts totally indulging himself. And so he eats, you know, 50 desserts at breakfast with all kinds of sugar, because what the hell, he's not going to die, he can't get sick anyway. He's just going to wake up and start over the next day. And he tries to seduce this woman and it fails. And he just, he just tried, he, he tries to use every new Groundhog Day as a, an opportunity to indulge his physical senses, because that's his first inclination. Well, if I'm going to get pleasure, I may as well get pleasure this way. What happens over time is that he starts to discover that if he's going to live the same day every day, eating tons of desserts or having sex with this woman is probably not going to make him happy. And he starts helping people. And he knows what's going to happen. So he starts helping people when they're in trouble. So I, I think uh, there's a kid that's going to fall out of a tree. And he knows it because he's been to that day before. And so he goes and he catches this kid falling out of the tree. And I think he knows these ladies are going to have a flat tire or something, a lady, four ladies in the car, and he, he goes and helps them because he knows they're going to have trouble. And, and there's this one lady who keeps trying to seduce over and over and over again, but he can't quite get there. And then he starts taking an interest in her. 
And instead of just trying to get sex from her, he really wants to get to know her. And he really wants to love her, not so much physically as spiritually. And, you know, over many, many days, his heart starts to open and his capacity to love increases and he starts moving to a deeper level of pleasure, which is spiritual pleasure. And then finally he wakes up from his bad dream because he learned to love. And that's, that's probably the most amazing pictorial depiction of moving from the nightmare to the happy dream. He didn't just wake up and, and you know, and get enlightened. He had to learn how to work his way out of the nightmare by growing spiritually and awakening. And then when he reached a certain threshold, the bad dream became a good dream. It's kind of like karma. You know, if you have bad karma and weird stuff keeps happening, it's going to keep happening usually until you start to work with it and recognize that the, quote, bad karma is a red, is a red flag. It's a wake-up call for you to try to come to life from a different angle. And then when you do that, the bad karma disappears and it starts to be replaced with good karma. And good karma is still in the dream. You understand? Good karma is a part of the dream. Grace is the entire awakening from the dream. But even with the dream, within the dream, there's grace. So the, the, the Course wants us to gradually, lovingly, joyfully keep shifting from the bad dream to the good dream. And so the Course wants us to ask, what is this for? That's, that's the question. And it says, before you take any action, let me go back, before you take any action, you can ask yourself, what's my purpose here? What, what is the purpose of this action? And it says that when your action is aligned with spirit, it's going to work out. When it's not, forget about it. You're going to have to go back and ask, what is this for? Again, let me give you a funny example. Um, I knew a woman who, uh, this guy was pursuing her, and she didn't really like him, but he was kind of wealthy, and he kept pursuing her. So she finally agreed to go on a date with him, and he wanted her to meet him in Chicago for a weekend, which she did. And she, uh, she was a part of one of my groups. And she came back after this date. And she said, it was the worst weekend of my life. She said, um, you know, we were driving around and I, I, I lo um, we got lost. And I know my way around Chicago really well, but everything went wrong. And then she said, oh, I, I dropped my phone in uh, whatever the Great Lake is by Chicago. <laughs> I lost my cell phone in the lake. And she said, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And I kind of coached her. And I said, well, what do you think happened? She said, well, you know, I don't think that my intention was really aligned with spirit. I didn't really like this guy. I was more impressed by his money. And I didn't know how to say no because he kept pursuing me. She said, I don't think I'll do that again. She said, I'm not going to go out with anybody for the money. And I'm not going to go, going to go out with anybody just because they're pursuing me. I'm going to have to really want to go out with that person for a good reason. So if she would have practiced this lesson, <laughs> what is this for beforehand, uh, you know, then uh, she would have a different experience. And, and a couple of years later, she came to my workshop with another guy and she was very happy. And she says, I really love this guy and I really want to be with him. And it was like a nice um, juxtaposition of the polarities of doing something for the wrong reason and then doing something for the right reason. In the first situation, her spirit, she was not really aligned in spirit with that the purpose. It was not God's will for her to be with that guy because her motivations were sullied. The second time around, uh, she had a good reason. She really loved the guy and she really wanted to be with him and she was in him for, with him for him not for his money. So the Course wants us, you know, there's, there's this suggestion that the Course gives at the beginning of every day. It says, every day, say, show me what I'm to do, where am I to go, what am I to do, 
And what am I to say and to whom? To show me today. And it says, if you set your mind up with that reference, with that intention, then at every moment you will be guided. That you can't go wrong when you say, Spirit, please show me. And later on, there's a section of the course called the Rules for Decision. And it gives us a guide how to make decisions. It says that the big mistake you make is that you make a decision and then you ask for guidance. <laughs> so you say, I'm going to... You know, I'm going to marry this person. And you ask, should I? <laughs> it says, I'm going to buy this real estate. And then you ask, should I? And it says, you will do a lot better if you ask, should I, before, <laughs> before you do the thing. Because, um, and this is, you know, we, we've talked about this before, where um, when you say, please show me, then you have to be willing to be shown any particular alternative. You can't say, please show me if I should marry this person as long as the answer is yes, because that's not a please show me. That's a dictation of a result. And I, you've heard me call this the truth smoke out, where you say, show me the truth about this. And then I will follow the truth you show me rather than me dictating the truth and then hoping that God might agree. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel was a very esteemed Jewish theologian, and he said, when I was young, I admired clever people, and now that I'm old, I admire kind people. And I have to say the same thing, that, you know, the more I go on in my life, the more impressed I am by kindness. Anybody can be clever but not anybody, not everybody is kind. And I think I had a turning point many years ago when I was in San Francisco and I was going from a hotel to the airport. I was waiting for the shuttle and it was a very hot summer's day and it was crowded, people were bugged. And uh, there was uh, this, this van driver, his name was Mike. And I saw him loading people onto the van. And the last person, the last seat he saved was for a young Asian woman, had a little boy with her, and her leg was like in a splint. And what he did was he, he so very kindly left the seat for her by the door, and he, um, he put her in it, and then he had a chat with the boy. He pulled this little six-year-old boy beside him. He said, now you're the man now. He said, your mom's counting on you. You gotta watch out for her. If her leg is hurting, watch out for her. And the kid, the kid pat on his fanny and put on the, on the, on the van. And I was really touched because he could have just loaded up the van and took off and gotten everybody, all the bug people to the airport but he took 30 seconds or a minute extra to give kindness to this woman who needed more help. And he lectured this boy in a loving way. And I thought that was a teachable moment. That was what Joel Goldsmith called a parenthesis in eternity, which means that time stopped for a moment and all separate interests dissolved and he was joining with this woman to help her and joining with this boy to help him and at that moment the nightmare all these people trying to get to the airport as fast as they could turned into a happy dream the same kind of thing happened to d and i yesterday we were standing in line at this health food store and you have to wait because they only allow a certain amount of people in and there's maybe i don't know a dozen people in line and a lady came up with one of those walkers and she was moving slowly and she started to get in line and she would have been, I don't know, 12th in line. And as she did, this woman who was standing next to us said, come on, darling, we're going to take you to the front of the line. You shouldn't have to wait with everybody. And the lady kind of resisted, oh, no, no, I don't mind waiting. And the other lady said, no, come on, we'll get you. And she walked this lady to the front of the line and said, this lady is disabled. Can you please let her in before everybody else. And of course, the, the agent did that and it worked. 
And that was another one of those moments when kindness showed up and it, it, it blurted out the, the nightmare. Um, and, you know, Dee's very good at stuff like this. She, she's always thinking about people. Once, once we were in um, North Kalahala, Hawaii, and there was a, um, there had been a blockage on the road. I think a tree had fallen down after a storm. And there was a long line of car. They, they had gotten the equipment out to move the tree and there were police on both sides, letting traffic through a little bit here and there where they could. And there was a long line of cars waiting to get through on our side. We were among it. And we finally got to the policeman who was directing traffic. And he said, you know, thank you so much for helping out. Everybody else was bugged, right? And she said, can we get you a sandwich? You'll get you some water or something like that. And the policeman said, well, thank you, but no, I'm okay. And I just thought that was so sweet of Dee to just remember that that policeman had needs too. It seemed to be that the police was causing a problem by making people to wait. Well, the policeman was just doing his job. And it seemed everybody else was bugged waiting to get through. But Dee had the presence of mind to stop and say, hey, can we give you a hand here? Can we help the policeman? Usually we think policemen are going to help us. But in that moment, she reversed the dream and it became a happy dream. And, you know, the policeman didn't accept the gift, but I'm sure the policeman was touched by it. It was a very nice offer. I, I doubt if anybody else in that line offered to help that policeman. So these are all seemingly little examples of things we can do to make each other's lives better. But in the big picture, they all contribute to fixing the happy dream. And so finally, there is a, this is one of my favorite lines from the course. It's from lesson 155. It says, there is a way of living in the world that is not here. Although it seems to be. So you're in the world. Your body's still moving around. You're going to the bank or the post office or whatever you're doing. And you're still doing the worldly thing, but your consciousness is in another place. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell another story. Um, let's move away from the slide for a moment. Um, years ago, I was sitting on an airplane, and uh, I was listening to a, a Bashar audio on the, my phone. Pretty good uplifting lecture. And I was sitting in the front row. And at that time, they had the screens right on the wall of the airplane. Now they have, it's all wireless. And this, this movie came on. And it was a silly teenage romance. And I wasn't really interested in the movie, but I could hardly not watch. I had to sat there with my eyes closed to not watch it. So I kind of tracked it a little bit here and there. And the plot was so inane that I... I I could figure out, it was easy to figure out what's going on in the movie without hearing the voices or the music. And this went on for the whole movie and I kind of got the movie as it was going on. But meanwhile, the greater part of my attention was, was uh, listening to this audio. And when the whole experience was over, I realized that I had been given a huge lesson in how to live in the world because the Course would say that the world is just an inane movie. It's silly. It's stupid. It's, it's inside out. It's upside down. It's insane. The Course says many, 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 many times that the world is insane. And if you haven't watched the news lately, <laughs> the world is insane. <laughs> and so even while I was tracking this movie, I could figure out what was going on. And at the same time, I was listening to a magnificent lecture. It was like downloading to me through this iPhone. And so the voice said, now you have your instructions. Watch the silly movie where you need to or, or, or do. But meanwhile, let the greater part of your attention be absorbed in higher power. Keep listening to the big lecture, even while part of you is, observed, is absorbed in this silly little movie. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. That's how it works. Maybe this is how great master, spiritual masters work. They, they see what's going on. They know, they're aware of the story. But that does not, does not distract them from the great lecture that God is giving them at every single moment. Okay, let's go back to the screen. So the Course says that we are 
uh, living in the world as if we're here, but not, not really. It says, you do not change appearance, although you smile more frequently. Your forehead is serene. Your eyes are quiet. And the ones who walk the world as you do recognize their own. In other words, when you're living in a high vibration, other people who are of the same vibration will recognize you. And you know this, don't you? Because you've gone to parties or had work meetings or going to some kind of gathering and you meet somebody and you have a lot to talk about because you're of like mind, you're the same vibration. You can, you can see the spiritual person of the party. Everybody's spiritual, but not everybody knows him. So I remember um, years ago, I went to this party and uh, at, a, at a retreat, at a conference, and I, I ran into this woman. Her name was Marie Manucherry. A lot of you know her. She's a wonderful intuitive. And uh, we just sat down and started talking, and everybody else was talking about a lot of mundane stuff, but we talked about some more interesting stuff, and we really had a great conversation. And we recognized each other as kindred spirits, and we became friends. And uh, I've been on her show many times. She sends lots of people to my coach training. I send lots of people to her. We're, you know, we have a, a wonderful, mutually supported professional relationship. And we just had, we were supposed to talk for an hour or two at that party. And we could care less about anybody else's conversation because we recognize each other as people of like mind. And we remained friends for many years. So how does that work? Because when you're in a certain frequency, Everyone else at that frequency is a match to you. And you recognize each other. You have certain kind of glasses on that, like those, those night vision glasses that they wear in the military, where you start to see things that nobody else sees because your vision is attuned to that hailing frequency, as they called it, on Star Trek. And the course goes on to say, yet those who have not yet perceived the way will recognize you also, and believe that you were like them as you were before. So what it's saying is that a spiritual person does not separate yourself or make yourself aloof from the world, that you can, you can have a conversation with anybody and they can feel like you're one of them because part of you is in the world and part of you is out of the world simultaneously. And I also remember years ago, I, I went with, we can put the video off, thank you, Michelle. Um, I went, I used to be part of this yoga class, and uh, during Christmas, the, uh, the teacher took a bunch of people to a hospital to do caroling, and um, we, we went to this one guy's room. At that time, I thought yoga is only, you only talk spirituality, and the yoga teacher went into this one guy's room, and we had the real down-home conversation. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Perth. Anybody. Hey, you ever go to Joe's Bar? Oh, yeah, I went to Joe's Bar. I used to do shots there. And he had this very earthy conversation with this guy who was in the hospital bed. And it really lifted this guy in the hospital bed to hear about Joe's bar in, in Perth Amboy. And so he was able to teach yoga and go to very high places in his yoga teaching and simultaneously have a very earthy conversation with this guy. So he was, he was part of everybody's group. He did not separate himself or make himself aloof from anybody. So that's the game in the world, but not of it. In the dream, but transforming the dream from the nightmare to the happy dream, and they have it. Okay, we have some time for questions and comments. Um, I believe Nishank has been fielding questions. You can, uh, if you have not already typed your question to him, you can do it. And I will take uh, questions and comments as well. Okay, Alan, we have a question from Sandra Campbell. Yes. And she asks, I just lost my pet who I've had for the last 16 and a half years. Oh, what yeah. does the course say about animals? Are they just part of our illusion or do they have a spirit that does not die? Well, sorry you lost your pet. I know what that's like. I've had that experience and it hurts. So I'm with you. Um, it's both. That animals have a physical being but there's also an element of them that can be spiritual. Now, I, I asked my teacher this very same question many years ago. Do animals have a soul? 
And she said, animals who live with people and the people treat them with love and kindness, they kind of develop a soul in that the love you give them calls forth the love that's in them, keep the potential love that's in them, and they kind of rise to a higher state of consciousness. So you might say that they become ensouled when your soul treats them like a loved divine being. So um, my belief is that even though the animal has a physical body while it's on the planet, when it returns to God, it's actually blessed and enhanced because of the soul that you imbued in it or that you lifted out of it. And I think there'll be a very good chance that this animal will come back to meet you because uh, souls recognize each other. Just like Marie and I recognize each other at the party, souls that belong to each other recognize each other. I hope that helps you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Joanne asks, uh, this chapter says, ego does not want you to wake up because it fears that the kingdom it has fabricated would dissolve. Uh, she's still having trouble comprehending ego as something other than me, outside of me, or not part of me, some kind of thing that I am subjected to. Please clarify and thanks for your patience. We could say, well, the course would say the ego is really not a part of you because the ego is based mostly on fear, entirely on fear, and who you really are is based entirely on love. So the ego is, is an erroneous thought about who you are, or we might say it's a, it's, it's a severely limited thought about who you are. So while the ego is not a part of your true self, it's a focalizing device that you use to participate in duality so you, can cern- so you can learn certain lessons that will lead you back to unity. I know that's a mouthful, but that's what I said. <laughs> and so think of it like your ego is your car, you might say. Um, so you know, your car helps you focalize in the physical plane and it drives you from place to place and it, it helps you accomplish certain tasks while you're in the world. But your car is not you. Your car has an identity separate from you. And there's a, you know, when you get out of your car, you remain who you are, independent of who you are while you're in the car. You may have been absorbed by the car, but you're not the car. So think of ego as a device that you use to focalize that you are bigger than it, but you can use it to help you in the world. Hope that helps. Thank you, Alan. And one more question from Luis Molim. Okay. When you talk, when you talk to someone who is at the same vibration as you, the talk is fluent. But when the vibes are different, what do you do? Walk away. Say that again, one more time, please, Nishank. So when we are talking to somebody uh, vibrating at the same frequency as we are, yeah, the conversation goes very fluent. Right. But when when they are at a lower vibration or something oh, like that, what can we do? Walk away. Well, you have some options. You can attempt to up-level the conversation by speaking more truth yourself and inviting that other person to meet you at a higher vibration. That's one option. Uh, You could walk away politely and just say, excuse me, I need something else I need to be doing. So that's an option. Uh, You could also allow the law, the law of attraction to help you. So I know you're talking about a particular conversation. Let's talk about a particular relationship. So let's say you have an old friend who you don't really vibe with anymore and they're, they're kind of vibrating at a denser level and you've gotten lighter. And you might say, what do I do? Well, in my experience, when, you, when two people are vibrating at different vibrations, there's no longer a Velcro and there's no reason for them to stick, stick around. And circumstances will move you both in different directions. So each of you can be with people who match you rather than trying to be with somebody who doesn't match you. But the simple answer is uh, try to up-level the vibration by speaking more truth yourself or find a way to gently step away. And, you know, there's probably somebody else in that room who your friend would have a better conversation with. There's somebody else who matches that person 
And why not free that person to talk to somebody who matches them rather than to try to force yourself to talk to them? Now, there's one more phrase from the course we could apply here. The course says, in any situation in which you perceive that something is missing, what is missing is what you're not giving. So you might say, well, okay, I'm kind of bored here. What could I say that would be more interesting to me so I'm not bored anymore? You're taking responsibility for your experience. And so you say something that's more meaningful to you that would be the, the foundation of a good conversation you would enjoy. And that's your offering. And then you offer it to the other person. They might respond, they may not. But at least you have given what you were missing. You've given yourself the gift. You have offered the other person the gift. And what happens after that is in spirit's hands. Either the conversation will stick or it won't. Either you walk away or you won't. And, but at least you've done your part by being integrity with what, what inspires you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have one more question we can take. Okay. Sure. So I think you've pretty much answered that. Uh, Adriana asks, how do you deal with a partner who rejects you? Can you visualize a miracle of them going back to loving you? I would never make it my goal to manage someone else's behavior. This is the big trick of the world, that if I can just get that person to change their behavior so I will enjoy their behavior more than I'll be happy. This is, this is ego. So if somebody rejects you, then there might be a good reason. You know, they're not a match to you. And so I would say to God, if this person belongs to me in any way, relationship, romantic relationship, business relationship, friendship, if this person belongs to me, then I will invite them spiritually to be with me. If they don't belong to me, then I don't want to try to force anything. Perhaps there's somebody better for them. Perhaps there's somebody better for me. And this is what the Course means by turning it over to the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, this relationship seems like it didn't work out here. Let me turn it over to Spirit. God, you guide this relationship. I want what is best for this person. I want what is best for me. If it would be right for us to be together, please bring them on. If not, I trust that they have a right place and I have a right place. And then you are free of the ego need to manipulate so this person conforms to your desired expectations. And then miracles happen. The person may show up again and say, hey, I made a mistake. Or the person may uh, vibrate, you know, out into the universe and somebody else will, will spin in. And you have to trust that the law of attraction is organizing all relationships for the highest and best result of everybody in the relationship. And when you can do that, you can drop your shoulders and unleash your solar plexus and relax and say, okay, bring on the best for me, God, whatever that it is. And you know what? God always brings on the best for you, whatever that is, without the ego's need to anxiously manipulate so you think you get what you think you need, but don't really. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time for the moment. Um, so let's close with a moment of meditation and prayer. Thank you so much. And Nishank has once again been stellar in organizing the slideshow and the questions. Thank you, Nishank. Thanks, Alan. Love doing it. Okay. So let's close our eyes for a moment and take a deep breath. So we recognize that on some level we're dreaming and that's okay. We pray now that our dream turns to a happy one. Not so much that particular events or things come to us, although that could be part of it. We ask that we drop into a place in our hearts where we are at peace. That's the real happy dream. So great spirit, we ask that you help us to remember who we are and what we are here for. We ask that we stay on track and on purpose with our mission to continually awaken 
and to remember our divine identity. We ask for deeper trust that we can recognize that the events that transpire around us are working on our behalf and on the behalf of those we touch. It is possible to change our lives to a happy dream even before we awaken entirely from the dream. We can come closer and closer and closer to awakening until the dream reflects heaven on earth, which basically means that love becomes our abiding experience even as we walk the earth. So we pray for the happy dream for everybody who's participating in this program live or to the recording. And we, we vision that great spirit walks beside us, within us, through us, and helps us transform our life so that any bad dreams dissolve, and that the happy dream becomes our ongoing, abiding, deeply fulfilling experience. And if you'd like to join me in this prayer, say out loud right where you are, and so it is. And so it is. Thank you everyone for joining us. I will see you next month. Have a happy dream of a month until we meet again. Thank you.